Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. If you have it, would you say amen? amen. Loud and proud. Amen. Loud and strong. Amen. Romans chapter 2. Let's jump over to verse 14 and we'll read 14 to 16. Romans chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. Indeed. Oh, give me one second. I am so sorry here. Gina, can you give me my phone, please? That was totally my mistake. I got so overwhelmed with Pastor Appreciation Day, I turned to the wrong thing. Thank you so much. Turn to the book of Acts. We're not in Romans. Turn to the book of Acts, please. The book of Acts, chapter 7. The book of Acts, chapter 7, verses 54 through 50. Acts chapter 7, 54 to 56. Now, if you have it, would you say amen? Amen. Amen. (laughs) Here we go. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious. Everybody say furious. And gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus. Everybody say, and Jesus. Jesus. That's important. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And here we are at verse 56. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the son of man standing at the right hand of God. Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for that you do all things well in our lives. Thank you that you have a master plan for us. Thank you that there's nothing that is outside of your knowledge and there's nothing outside of your plan for us. And so, Father, today, as we come together and as we prepare our hearts for receiving from you, God, I ask that you will do something magnificent in this place. I ask that you will touch your people. I ask that you touch their hearts. I ask that you touch their lives. I ask that you move by the power of your spirit and give them something that they've never had before. I ask God that at the conclusion of this series, that you will drop something in their lives and in their lap that they've never touched before. And so God, I ask for supernatural minds, supernatural hearts, and supernatural understanding to move into new dimensions with you. And so God, while we're here together, may they receive from you and anoint me and empower me to give your word to your people for your glory and for their good. In the name of Jesus, and everybody said amen Amen. and amen. Go ahead, look at your neighbor. Tell them the glory of God, God. a seeable glory. glory. And you may take your seats in the presence of the Lord. Let's read Acts uh, 7 and 55. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus at the right hand of God. I need to do something very quickly. I need to give you a quick synopsis of Stephen or Stephen. Because how many of you know that we cannot receive or be transformed by anything unless we understand where it came from? Whenever you deal with the word of God, whenever you come to the motive and the heart of coming to a conclusionary piece of understanding for your life, in order to come to conclusion and pure understanding, we must know where it came from. That's why there's so many people running around with horrible theology. Because they don't understand the basics of theology. They don't understand the basics of the word. And therefore, they come up with erroneous conclusions. But if you go back to Bible basics and you go back to theology 101, then you'll realize that much of what people say today have nothing to do with what the Bible says. It's just been recycled error that gets transferred along the way. And so here we are at the last sermon in the series on what? The glory of God. How many of you know we've had some incredible Sunday mornings this month? And God has been moving by his spirit so powerfully and so intensely. 
And so here we are at the last message, and we've gone through the Old Testament about a filling glory, how God wants to fill the house, um, a seeing glory, if you will, with Moses. He said, let me see your glory, and God allowed him to see it, and he hit him in the cleft of the rock. And the Bible says that God passed by Moses and only allowed him to see his back because no one can look God face to face and live. And so here we are, and we make the big, ginormous leap into the New Testament, and we find ourselves in the book of Acts. Now, the book of Acts chapter 7 takes place some couple of years after the time of Jesus. Jesus has already ascended to the Father. He already gave the Great Commission. The day of Pentecost has already happened. The Holy Ghost has infilled mankind, and mankind is now walking around with God by His Spirit living on the inside of them. And there's a man named Stephen whom the Bible says is full of the Holy Ghost. That's probably one of the first times your Bible will ever mention a person being full of the Holy Ghost. In the Old Testament, the Holy Ghost came upon somebody and then he left. He rushed through somebody to do a mighty miracle like Elijah and Samson and all the prophets, but then he would leave. Now in the New Testament and in the New Covenant, God by his spirit is indwelling mankind forever, not for a day, not for a moment, not for a minute, not until somebody messed up and sinned real bad and then the Holy Ghost had to leave like he did Samson. No, the Holy Ghost, the Bible says, by this point in time, has indwelt the uh, mankind. He's living in mankind, and he refuses to leave. Jesus said, li- listen to this, disciples. He said, he, said, uh, he said, the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, he said, he's been with you, but he will be in you. That is a permanent position of the occupation of the Spirit of God in somebody's life. I don't care what you do. I don't care what you say. I don't care how you did it. That's between you and God. But there is a forever reality and it's this once the Holy Ghost has lived on the inside of you and has taken residence on the inside of you he has no intention of leaving he has no intention of vacating he's not going to take a vacation to your life or to your spirit and say I'll see you later when you reconcile and repent before God no he's on the inside of you working out the reality of repentance through your mind getting you to the place where we need to be in God and he says but at all that time and at the same time that I'm working on you I'm not going to leave you and so we have a man named Stephen who the Bible says is full of that Holy Ghost and I just want to know very very quickly before I get started in this in this message how many of y'all want to just be full of the Holy Ghost he's just working he's just speaking he's just talking to you he's just moving through you that's who this Stephen is. He is a son. He is, a, a, he is somebody that comes out of this new movement, this new covenant, the way, the new church of Jesus Christ. And this Stephen, this young man, he was some, actually by this time, he was some 30 years old or so. He was in his early to mid 30s. And he moves through the streets of where he lived and he moves through his locale and he moves through his community and he begins to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Extra biblical resources say that Stephen was actually a deacon in the church. What is a deacon for those who don't know? A deacon is a helper. A deacon is somebody who comes in to help and to assist and to do whatever it is that's being asked. That's what a deacon is. If, if water needs to be filled, the deacon does that. If sound needs to be done, the deacon does that. If people are falling all over the floor, the deacon comes in to catch people if they're falling by the power of the Holy Ghost. That's what a deacon does. They have the spirit of helps on the inside of them. And so Stephen is moving through where he lives. He's preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's a deacon in the new church. He's a follower of Jesus. And he's moving in signs, wonders, and miracles. And out of his mouth is not just the gospel of Jesus. Jesus Christ is not just the euangelion, the good news of Jesus Christ, but the Bible says that there's wisdom that's coming out of him that cannot be matched by anyone. So wherever he's moving, wisdom's coming out. Wherever he's moving, intelligence is coming forth. While he's moving and talking and speaking and communicating, people are listening to Stephen and saying, man, I don't know where this guy gets what he gets. I don't know where, what books he reads. I don't know what YouTube channel he's listening to, but there is something 
something about this guy that is so different from anyone else. I just came by to tell you quickly that when you're full of the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost is speaking on the inside of you, you're going to sound different than everybody else. You're going to talk different than everybody else. You're going to look different than everybody else. You're going to move in signs and wonders and healing and miracles the moment the Holy Ghost has taken residence on the inside of you and has filled you by his spirit. Amen. I'm sure the Holy Ghost was real happy while he was living in Stephen. He said, well, I like this guy. I mean, I'm enjoying inhabiting him because this man will let me do anything that I want to do. Do you know that it is the will of the Holy Ghost? Number one, to execute the will of God on the earth. Number two, to use you to do it. And number three, to move in absolute freedom in your life and in the lives of others. Well, how can you say that? Because if the Holy Ghost is the agency of activity in the earth now, then he is the same Holy Ghost in Genesis who's hovering over the the waters, waiting to move in activity by the word of God, the Father. So the Holy Ghost is always waiting to be active in his essence. He's always waiting in activity to do something. That's who he is. That's his nature. That's his character. That's his makeup. He hasn't changed then. He ain't changing now. And so Stephen or Stephen is moving in this Holy Ghost power. He's moving in this Holy Ghost glory. He's moving in this Holy Ghost freedom. He's moving in Holy Ghost message and Holy Ghost words. And what's interesting is this. Is that he has followers and he has rejectors. He has people who come alongside of him and say, you know what? I love this guy, Stephen. He sounds good. He's theologically correct. I don't know. He might have been a handsome guy. I have no idea what Stephen looked like. But people began to move toward him. People began to flock toward him. People began to receive his message and whatever it is that he said and whatever it is that he did. But at the same time, there were people who came in to reject him. There were people who came in to shun him. There were people who said, you know what? I don't like what he says. I don't like what he does. As a matter of fact, I don't know where he gets what he gets. I don't know this. I don't understand this power that he moves and that he operates in. And as a matter of fact, just to make a, add insult to injury, what he's saying is an irritant to us. Why? Because he's speaking about this man named Jesus. He, he's speaking about this man named the Christ. And let me tell you who his rejectors were. His rejectors were the Pharisees of his time. His rejection came from the leaders of the religious movement of that day. And the people who were stuck there looked at him and said, you know what? I don't like this guy. I don't like what he says. I don't like anything about him. I don't like about the way he preaches. I don't like how he looks. And I sure don't like what he moves in or what he's talking about. So let's go ahead and let's do something to him to get rid of him. How many of you know that whenever you move in apostolic ministry and whenever you move in prophetic ministry and a thus saith the Lord comes out of your mouth there are always going to be people who have something to say there are always going to be people who want to reject the new move of God but I'm so glad that in this church and in this kingdom and in the ministry of God on the earth God says you do absolutely anything that it is that I tell you to do and when you do I'm going to be there and I'm going to move and I'm going to be powerful and I'm going to be glorious and I'm going to be mighty and I'm going to get the praise and the glory and the honor whenever it is you do what it is that I'm telling you to do. I came by to tell you quickly God has a new move God has a new instruction God God has a new mandate and he says I have something new I have a new season for your life and if you'll simply know and obey and understand what it is that I'm telling you to do you will see something you've never seen before 
It doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter the scorn. It doesn't matter the ridicule. It doesn't matter their word against you or whatever it is you say or do. The only thing that matters is the approval of the Holy Ghost that lives on the inside of you and the approval of God Almighty that's standing in the heavenly saying, go ahead and keep doing what I told you to do. Go ahead and keep saying how I told you to do it. I'm standing here congratulating you and applauding you. That's what God says to you and that's what God says to me. I feel so, you know, God just, he just keeps moving me over here. I feel so sorry for young preachers today who want to move in the things of God and can't because their people won't let them. I feel so bad for young ministers today and men who are in my position who've taken over a ministry and taken over ministries and they can't move because people are rejecting the move of God in in that church. And they succumb to the pressure and they sit down under the pressure of people's ridicule and rejection because they don't want that in their church. And then the pastor has nothing else to do and no other option to take but to either stay doing what it is they want him to do or to leave and vacate without without sheep. But I'm so glad in this church... There's some folk in here who want the move of God, who want the glory of God, who want the power of God, and for God to do whatever, whenever, however he wants to do it in this place so he might get the glory and all of the praise. And so Stephen is a man like the men we're discussing. Stephen stands at a, as, as the great Pastor Rod Parsley would say, at a strategic inflection point. Do I continue doing what it is I'm called to do or do I not? Do I continue preaching the gospel, the good news, the evangelion of Jesus Christ to the people who come my way and out of my life and out of my spirit come signs and wonders and miracles and transformation for them and for me? Or do I take the other road? And do I do what the religious leaders of my day are telling me and sit down, be quiet, don't say anything unless it has anything to do with all of the 365 laws for Moses? I'm so glad that I can answer that question for you right now. Because the Bible says that Stephen continued doing what it is that he was called to do. Yes. Stephen kept praying. Stephen kept preaching. Stephen kept laying hands on people. Stephen kept seeing the sick recover. Stephen kept seeing the lame move and the deaf hear and the blind see. Out of his bosom and out of his spirit came words of wisdom and might and rhema that came from the Holy Ghost. And he continued to move in the very thing that God called him to move into. Yes. Didn't matter who was around, didn't matter the ridicule, didn't matter the scorn, didn't matter the culture of the day. He said, I'm going to stand here, I'm going to open my mouth, and I'm going to declare and decree, thus saith the Lord out of my spirit. Well, how many of you know that whenever you choose to do something for God or continue to do something for God, the persecution will continue? You see, it's amazing because God will supernaturally anoint you and empower you to do incredible things for the kingdom and for him. But just because he's anointing you and empowering you to do something for him does not mean that the persecution and the attack is going to go away. He just anoints you and protects you through the attack. He just keeps his hand over you while the attack is coming by you. And he says, don't worry, because I have something for you to do. And so Stephen is still dealing with the ridicule of the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin of that day. Who was the Sanhedrin? The Sanhedrin was a large council of men that were together who supported the law of Moses in the temple. And so the Bible says this. It says, and so the council, the men. You know, it's funny. The Bible tells us that what their name was, this little group, they were called the freedmen. Now, how many know that's hypocritical? (laughs) You got these uptight, hard-nosed, stuck-in-the-past, anti-Jesus, 
anti-Holy Ghost men, and they call themselves free. You know that's religion. Because religion says we're free when they know they're not. And so these freed men, they devise a plan together, and they say, here's what we're going to do. We're going to gather some other followers. We're going to gather some other people, and we're going to have them lie on Stephen. And so they're going to lie and they're going to tell the people and they're going to tell the main leaders that Stephen is talking about destroying the temple. We're going to tell them that he's been anti-Moses and anti what Moses said and anti what Moses wrote. And that will pretty much seal the deal. Do you realize that when people come in to destroy you and to attack you, they're always going to come in to attack your identity They're always going to come in to attack who you are on the inside. They're going to come and try to attack what it is that God put in you. And the genuineness that God created you with. They're always going to attack what you are. Mm -hmm. And Stephen is no different. Stephen is not outside of the bounds of attack. Stephen was not thrust outside of the lines of combat. No, as a matter of fact, he was put right in the forefront. But how many of you know that when you're in the forefront of attack and when God allows you to be in the forefront of attack, that means there's something on the inside of you that is mighty. There's something on the inside of you that must be powerful. There's something on the inside of you where your name and your message and what you're made of is going to change the world forever. And God said, if I put you in the forefront of battle, that doesn't mean I hate you. That doesn't mean I left you. It means I love you and I care for you. And I'm about to use you in a way you never dreamed before. And so they take Stephen with all of these men. It reminds me of the book of Daniel. It relies on him and scandalizes his name and tries to destroy his character and his reputation. And Stephen, just like Daniel, is now thrown in front of people having to defend himself. And the Bible says this, and I love how Stephen does it because he doesn't use his own words. He doesn't use uh, his own intelligence. He doesn't use his own genius or brilliance. He uses the Bible. He says, he says, you want to hear my defense to you? You want to hear what it is that I have to tell you regard to what I've been doing and saying and the accusations of what it is that you've thrown against me? Here's my word to you, Sanhedrin. Here's my word to you, freedmen. Um, back in the day, there was a man named Moses, and, and Moses gave the law, and before him came Abraham, who was the father of faith, and, and after Abraham came his son Isaac, and, and after his Isaac came Jacob, and the 12 tribes, and there have always been men and women of God who prophesied a coming king and, and a coming redeemer. And as a matter of fact, if we just jump forward just a few years back, you You'll remember that this promised son came and he suffered and he bled and he died, but but he rose again. And and as a matter of fact, let me tell you who was responsible for it. You were. Mm -hmm. And his defense is putting the guilt back on the people who are accusing him using the word of God. Whenever somebody comes to you to attack you. Whenever somebody comes in to destroy you, to dismantle you, to scandalize you, and to make other people think that you are not what it is that you know you are, and you are not what it is that God has already declared you to be, there is one thing for you to do. It's to open this book and declare the word of God to them. It's to open this book and declare, thus saith the Lord, and say, I am sanctified. I am redeemed. I am blood bought. I am blood washed by the power of the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost lives on the inside of me. So take that, sit down, be quiet, and be still. I'm about tired. Now I'm going to get mad. You know, Pastor, you never really don't get mad. I'm about to get mad. I am tired of the body of Christ ridiculing its preachers and worship leaders and trying to destroy them because of a personal preference that they think God said. 
God looks at that and says, that is not my body. That's not what I died for. That's not what I purchased. I purchased to give them unity. I've died to give them wholeness. I died to give them freedom. I died to give them mutual encouragement. I died so that they might come together as my bride. How many of you know that in any bride and groom relationship, there should be no conflict? God says, I did something for you to put you together, to dress you and to clean you. And you're dirtying it up. So stop it because it's not of me. And the body of Christ is bent on destroying its leaders. Why? Because it's an agenda from the enemy. Because if you can destroy a leader, you destroy a move for a generation. And if you destroy a move, you destroy the purpose of God for that epoch and era. And the enemy stands back and goes, I did it again. I was successful again. And God looks and says, and now I have to wait another 40 years to raise somebody up. Because the generation of that time destroyed them. You know, the leader can only take so much. I know this is getting really heavy right now. But how many know the Holy Ghost is in this place? Be very careful about what you say about a leader, a man, or woman of God. Because God says, touch not mine anointed and do my prophets no harm. And so Stephen, everybody say, and so Stephen. And so Stephen is now brought before the men, brought before these Pharisees. And here's his defense. There's his answer. And the Bible says this. Is that as he began to speak. And once he took the gavel, if you will, the proverbial gavel. And slammed it on the desk. And slammed it in front of him. And declared them guilty. The Bible says that the Pharisees and the religious leaders of that day. Began to scream and gnash their teeth. How many of you know that's a type and picture of hell? For the, for the same spirit and the same agenda of the enemy and all of the fruit that comes out of what he wants to do that concludes into the weeping and the gnashing of teeth is the same activity that takes place when he has his hooks in a man or a woman to destroy the man of God. And they're gnashing their teeth at Stephen and they're screaming at him because they can't take the truth that's now hitting them square in the face. And the Bible says this. It says while they were screaming and while they're yelling and while they're gnashing their teeth at him, the Bible says, and Stephen looked up. And when he looked up, In the middle of the altercation, he sees something. What does he see? He sees the glory of God. He looks up in the middle of the screaming. He looks up in the middle of the gnashing of teeth. He looks up right in the middle of the attack. And he looks up to the sky. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the clouds begin to part. And the sky begins to open. And with his own eyes, he sees the glory of God. He can see the Father sitting there. He can see the Father sitting in authority, sitting in power, sitting in brilliance, seated in magnificence. And he says, I can see it right now in the middle of all the slander in the middle of all the lies in the middle of all the attack I can see the glory of God God has allowed me to see something that I've never seen before he's allowing me to put my eyes upon something that I've never put my eyes upon before I can see the glory of God right here I'm not even hearing these men anymore I can't even see them anymore all I see is the glory of God that word glory there is the Greek word doxa d-o-x-a and it means the splendor of God Stephen looks up and he says this, I can see the splendor of God Almighty. What is it, Santino? It is the magnificence or the splendid appearance of God. He looked up and he saw the beauty of God. 
He looked up and he saw the grace of God. He looked up and he saw how beautiful God is, not was, is. He said, I've never seen anything like this before. I've never seen colors like this before. I've never seen radiance like this before. Maybe Stephen was a good looking guy. Maybe he was related to somebody good looking. But he said, you know what? Don't matter who's good looking down here. Nothing compares to this. I don't care the land that I've seen. I don't care the seashores that I've, that, I, that I've been on. I don't care the waters that I've traveled. There is nothing more beautiful than this. My eyes have looked upon and have gazed upon a radiance that I've never seen before and have imbibed and engendered a beauty that I've never seen. And when his eyes met with the glory of the Father, he was captivated by the power that lied within the glory. And while he is basking in everything that God is showing him, all the crowd begins to fade. All of the attack begins to go. Every slander begins to dissipate while he's looking at the glory. Do you know that when your eyes become so focused on the glory, you can't see anything else? Do you realize that when your eyes gaze upon the splendor and the grandeur of God, your tangible man, your fleshly suit is not preoccupied with anything else? Everything that came against you is now vanquished. Yes. Everything that came to attack you is now gone. The deadening blows of your adversary and the fiery darts that come against your life are now vanquished because you have put your spirit, because you're full of the Holy Ghost in the presence and glory of God. God says, he says, when you put your eyes on me, when you put your eyes on my glory, then everything around you will begin to dissipate and disappear. His eyes saw the master who was watching over him in the midst of his conflict. Whenever you and I go through attack, Whenever you and I go through assault, whenever we go through a hard season, the glory of God will always appear. Yes. Yes. Because God refuses to leave you without his glory. God refuses to depart from you without leaving you his glory. Because God knows that the glory is a protected from the enemy. I didn't say that the attack wouldn't come. I didn't say that the disease wouldn't come. I didn't say that the sickness wouldn't come. I didn't say that the off season wasn't going to come to your life. But the fact of the matter is this, is that in any season that you find yourself in, the glory of God is always going to be there. The power of God is always going to be there. The splendor of God is always going to be there. The brilliance of God is always going to be there. So come hell or high water, the glory is going to show up. Come attack, the glory is going to show up. Come fear, the glory is going to show up up come assault the glory is going to show up and God says in every moment in every season in every second of attack I will make sure that my glory shows up in your life my splendor is going to show up in your life my appearance is going to show up in your life so sit still and know that I am God and you have nothing to fear God has a dispensation of glory waiting when we are in the hardest moments of our life and when we are there, a window will open that enables us and empowers us to see his glory and splendor for us. Yes. You know, I just, I just love being a Christian. Amen. Amen. I just love being a believer. Yeah. Because I know that because of what I am, his glory 
is mine. You see, I, I can't speak for the unsaved person. I, I can't speak for my unsaved friend. I can't speak for my unsaved neighbor. But, but for me and, and for you and, and for you and for you and, and, and for you and for you and for you, the glory of God is yours. Yes. It's going to show up right when you need it. Yes. His splendor is going to just arise whenever you need it. The moment the attack comes in like an assault, he's going to open the window of heaven. He's going to open an ability to see in supernatural activity and say, I can see something that I never saw before. I'm looking at something that I've never seen before. Oh my goodness, I'm seeing the glory of God right here in the middle of my life, right here in the middle of my situation, right here in the middle of my scenario. And God is here by his spirit showing me his glory. He shows it to you to protect you. He shows it to you to give you peace. He shows it to you to let you know that he is with you no matter what and the Bible says that Stephen looks up and he sees the glory the splendor the grandeur of God and next to him everybody say next to him I want you to see it I want you to see Stephen on the ground I want you to see them screaming all around him I want you to see them gnashing their teeth at him and I want you to see him looking up and he's saying the glory of God in the midst of it all. And next to God, the Bible says he saw. I'm, I'm, I almost don't even want to give it away yet. I feel like it's, it's like the gift in that bag. I don't know what's in there. I hope it's not a ginormous polka dotted tie, but you know. <laughs> and, and he saw, not Peter, not Thomas, not James, not Bartholomew. He showed and see Judas. <laughs> he didn't see Moses. He didn't see Elijah. He didn't see Daniel, Obadiah, Nahum, Habakkuk, or Zephaniah. The only person that he saw was Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, goodness. The only one who's worthy to position himself on the side of the Father Amen. and stand with him next to his glory. Now, the interesting thing is this, is that the Bible says that when Stephen or Stephen saw Jesus, he wasn't sitting. The Bible in other verses says, and Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. David says, and my Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. But Stephen says this, he says, I see the glory, I see the doxa, I see the splendor of God, I see the brilliance of God, I see the grandeur of God, and I see Jesus standing next to him. Why is that significant? Because the word standing is the Greek word histemai, and it means this, settling the matter. Jesus is standing next to the Father. And he's standing, looking at Stephen all the way down there. And he said, son, don't worry about anything. Don't worry about what they're saying. Don't worry about what it is that they're doing to you. Don't worry about the assault. Don't worry about the attack. I'm standing, settling the matter. I'm standing as the ultimate judge of authority with a gavel in my hand about to declare them guilty and you innocent. I'm about to do something in your life, settling the matter that you're in right now. And the Bible says that Jesus stands at the right hand of the Father and he is settling the matter. He's standing in authority. He's standing Amen. in power. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. He's standing in absolute brilliance and authority in everyone's life. Waiting to settle the matter. Don't worry about it. He's waiting to do something in the midst of his people that have never been done before individually. 
He said, I know exactly what it is you're going through. I know exactly what it is that you're dealing with. I know the assault. I know the attack. I know the question that you have on the inside of you. I know exactly what you're feeling because Jesus said, don't worry. They did the same thing to me. But I also know what's going to come as a result of this. And the Bible says, and I'm almost done. That when Stephen said this, when he gave one of the ultimate revelations of Christ and said, this one who you persecuted, this one who you killed, this one who self-proclaimed to be the son of man and the son of God, that one, I now see him standing next to the father. And that last revelation caused them to pick up stones and began to stone him. They stood by the law of Moses and they said, we are absolutely authorized to do this based on what you've just said. And the Bible says, and as the stones began to come, and as the stones began to strike him and attack him, and hit him in the face and hit him in the forehead and hit him in the ear and hit him on the body. And all of a sudden, he's looking at stones all over the place. The Bible says, and Stephen fell asleep. But just before he did that, he said, and now, receive your service. did the glory of God has two dimensions to its application either to save you from where you are physically or to remove you from where you are spiritually and Stephen was a recipient of the ladder. And God looked at him and said, I showed you my glory. I showed you my brilliance. I allowed you to see me standing in authority over your life. And now I'm going to call you home. There are two things that are real in this life. You will go through attack. But the glory of God is going to be there. The second is this. One day. Your eyes will close for the last time. And you will breathe your last. And God by his spirit, authority, power and grace. Will bring you into his glory. And you won't just have glimpses of it. You'll be able to bask in it forever and forever. His glory is a seeable glory. Here and there. And you will see it with your own eyes as he begins to move in your life. As Jesus stands to settle the matter and do something for you you've never seen before. I want you to bow your heads right now. Father, I thank you. I give you glory. I give you praise. I worship you now. And so for every person 
who's going through. For every person who's been under attack. For every person who is battling some, some type, some, some form of scorn, shame, ridicule, sickness. I speak your glory now. I speak your brilliance now. I speak your grace now. I speak the splendor of the kingdom now. I speak the solution of God in every life right now. Can I get regular piano, please? I speak everything that God wants to do in every heart right now. I don't care what's coming against you. I don't care the attack. I don't care the slander. I don't care about the ridicule. I don't care what has come out of somebody's mouth about you. The only thing that matters is what God says about you. And the only thing that matters is the glory of God that's about being made ready to be manifest in your life. That's the only thing that matters. And whatever it is that God has declared to you and whatever it is that God has said to you and whatever he said over your life is yours. You are powerful. You are mighty. You are glorious. You are enabled, you are empowered for the pulling down of enemy strongholds. You were designed to put on the helmet of salvation and pick up the shield of faith and put on the breastplate of righteousness and snap the belt of truth. Pick up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, as your feet are fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. That's who you are. You are the blood bought, you are the redeemed of God Almighty. And God has declared you to be so. So let go of every attack. Let go of every slander. Let go of every will of, of the enemy against your life. Because if it didn't come from God, then it's not of God. And if it's not of God, then God's going to stand to seal the matter. And you will find yourself on the winning side while the other one has egg all over their face. That's the God that you and I serve. That's the God that you and I worship. That's the God that you and I honor. And so I come against every lie. I come against every attack. I come against every onslaught and every word of attack against you, your life, your identity, your purpose. I come against it in the name of Jesus. Devil, I bind you now. And in the name of Jesus, I set you free. Beef, beef, boo. I can feel in this room right now. Be free right now in the name of Jesus. Be free right now in the name of Jesus. Be free right now in the name of Jesus. Minds be free in the name of Jesus. Hearts be free in the name of Jesus. Emotions be free in the name of Jesus. So low self-esteem, you gotta go in the name of Jesus. Every time you look at yourself in the mirror and say, I'm not really much to anything and God's not really gonna use you, that gotta go in the name of Jesus. That's not what God says about you. That's not what God has decreed over your life. Be free in the name of Jesus. Be free in the name of Jesus. Be free. In the name of Jesus, now! Be free now. In Jesus' name. God Almighty has a plan for you. God Almighty has a purpose for your life. He's here by His Spirit right now. He is settled in this place right now. 
This is another dimension of the glory of God. Of What was the Hebrew word? Kabod. The Greek word doxa. I, I, I am telling you something and I mean this absolutely honestly. Standing from my point right now, this vantage point right now, I can see a mist in this room. I don't know if I'm the only one, but I can see a mist in this room. That is the glory of God. That is the Shekinah of God. That is the Kavod of God. That is the Doxa of God. There's a mist in this room and it's for you and it's for me as he settles upon us right now to touch you right in the middle of your knee, to touch you right in the middle of your psyche, to touch you right in the middle of your body and your heart to bring to you what it is that he wants to give you. It's here right now. Stand on your feet, stand on your feet, stand on your feet, stand on your feet. Can you play Holy Spirit for this room, please? Please, please, Holy Spirit for this room, the, the third song we did. God has not instructed me or ordered me to lay hands on anybody. What he wants you to do, he wants you to lift your hands. What have we been teaching? Whenever God opens a window, what do we do? Yes. Amen. We open our window and we worship him. We're going to be here for about five more minutes. And God's going to begin to touch people. God's going to begin to deliver people. I'm, I'm not even going to be the, the, the medium by which it happens. God's going to do it all by himself. When the mist shows up, you don't, there, there's nothing else for the preacher to do. He just allows God to do whatever it is that he wants to do. But he's here right now. So lift your hands in his presence. I need you to worship him right now. Before we sing, before we sing, before we do anything, I just need you to worship him right now. I need you to worship him right now. I need you to worship him right now. I need you to open your mouth and worship him right now. I need you to worship him right now. Can I get a little microphone, please, in a moment? A little microphone. I need you to worship him right now. We're almost there. I need you to worship him right now. I need you to open your mouth. Open your mouth. Open your mouth. Open your mouth. Go, Gina, sing now. Open your mouth. God is here. He's here right now. He's here by his spirit. Yeah, that's it. He's here by his spirit. Open your mouth and worship him. Praise him. Praise the God of glory. Praise the God of might. Praise the God of real He's here right now. We need your presence. We need you. This is the glory of God. Holy Spirit fill And it's in this, this house room. right now. Sing, Gina. Holy Spirit fill this room. Shekinah. Shekinah glory sweet perfume. My body is literally shaking under we the presence of God right presence. now. We need you. My lips, my hands, my, my stomach is, is trembling right now. Because God room. is in this house. Holy Spirit fill this room. Shekinah. Shekinah glory sweet perfume. Because we need your presence. God. We need your presence. We need you. Holy Spirit fill this room. Holy Spirit fill this room. Sing, sing, sing. Jesus, Jesus. Fill this oh, Master, we praise you. Shekinah glory, we worship you now. sweet perfume. We give you glory right now. We give you we praise. We need your presence. We, we worship you. you. We tell you glorious. We tell you mighty. We tell you holy. Spirit, fill this room. God, touch every single person now. Deliver minds, deliver hearts, deliver spirits, deliver souls, deliver bodies. I come against every attack of the enemy. I come against every lie of the adversary. I come against every agenda that's come against your life to keep you in a place where you're stuck in your past and you can't move into your future. I come against it in the name of Jesus now. Do your work in this place. 
Do your work in this house. Do your work in your people by the power of your spirit. Lift your hands, lift your hands, lift your hands. Lift your hands. I need every single person in this place right now with your own mouth, with your own lips to say thank you to him. Not thank you to me, not thank you to Gina, not thank you to Marion, not thank you to, your, to yourself or your neighbor. I need you to say, God, I thank you now. I give you glory now. I give you thanks right now. I give you honor now. I worship you. I bow before you. I bow before your footstool. And as the deer pounded forth toward the water, my soul after you I worship you now I thank you 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 Give it to him now. 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 By the power of your spirit. For we need your presence and we need you. We thank you. And so from this day and always, Holy Spirit, fill this. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We love you, we praise you, and we honor you. Always be with us, always rest upon us, always rest among us by your spirit. We need you every time we come together. So Holy Ghost, Shekinah glory, Shekinah brilliance, come on, doxa. May it be here. Oh, always. In the name of Jesus. And so, go in his glory. Go in his mind. Go in his covered and his doxa for your life. In his glory, his splendor. In Jesus' name. God bless you.